This is lecture 4 on natural language processing. We will talk about two views of language technology. Let us look at the presentation in the slide and what we see here is that uh, there are two views of natural language processing. The first view is classical view, layered processing various ambiguities which we have been discussing over last uh, few lectures, last three lectures actually. And the other very predominant view is statistical or machine learning view. Let us spend some time on understanding the difference between these two views. Why is it that there are two views of natural language processing? There are two predominant approaches. The first approach is the classical approach. We have seen many different stages of natural language processing, namely phonetics, phonology and so on. At every stage there are ambiguities which also have been discussed extensively. In classical view of natural language processing, the onus of processing is on human beings. In this view, a machine essentially executes the instructions given by a human being. Let us look at the slide and remember what we saw on various stages of natural language processing. The first stage was phonetics and phonology and then came morphology, lexical analysis, syntactic analysis, semantic analysis, pragmatics and discourse. In each of these stage, there are human beings involved who create rules guided by linguistics, lexicography, knowledge of language and so on, which makes the machine process natural language data or information. Just to take an example, if we take the example of syntactic analysis, where one needs to parse a sentence. What happens is that a linear structure is given, a sentence is given and from that sentence we obtain a tree corresponding to the sentence. We identify the noun phrase and the verb phrase. Within the verb phrase we find out the verb and so on. This whole processing happens by means of grammatical rules which a human being has encoded. A, somebody who understands the language well has sat down and produced the grammatical rules. Now, when this grammar is written, the person producing this grammar has to anticipate all possible language phenomena which exist in that language and try to capture them in terms of grammatical rules. So, let me show you an example of a grammatical rule by writing it on the paper. So, suppose I say that a noun phrase n p, this is the symbol for a noun phrase n p goes to a noun. So, that means, a noun phrase can be expressed by a single noun or a noun phrase can be an adjective and a noun. Let me give an example, noun phrase going to noun could be boy, noun phrase going to adjective and noun could be little boy. Okay. Noun phrase can also go to noun and preposition phrase. For example, boy with toys. So, all these are noun phrases. Let us look at the lines once again. Noun phrase can be a noun for example, boy. Noun phrase can be an adjective a noun, little boy. Noun phrase can be a noun with a preposition phrase, boy with toys. Preposition phrase again it can be expanded as a preposition p and a noun phrase of coming after that. So, 
preposition so preposition again can be preposition phrase can be p and n p that means a preposition a noun phrase and p in turn can be things like with by in for and so on okay so you can see what i did i wanted to give a grammar for a noun phrase so what are the possibilities of a noun phrase noun phrase can be a single noun noun phrase can be adjective and noun noun phrase can be noun followed by a preposition phrase preposition phrase on the other hand is preposition followed by noun phrase preposition can be with by in for and so on so this shows that to capture a language phenomenon and to give its grammar we need to anticipate all possible situations we have to understand all possible situations now this is what a language expert does a language expert knows various language situations and produces rules for them okay noun phrase going to noun noun phrase going to adjective and noun these are actually rules expressing language phenomena so in classical view of natural language processing the complete onus or the burden is on this kind of rules which are created by human beings this was the scenario in natural language processing rules and knowledge came from human beings the advent of web changed the scenario in a very dramatic way because of the internet a large amount of text in electronic form became available on the web and this text also can be processed by a machine so machine processable text in large volume became available and this kind of text was a, a very rich repository a gold mine so to say of language phenomena now here was a here was a possibility where this language data or text could be processed by a machine and the regularities in the language or the constraints could be uncovered from this text okay there is a technical name for the text let me write it down the technical name for text is corpus i write it in a very bold font and large font because corpus is highly important very very important in nlp in natural language processing so when we have corpus in electronic form large amount of textual data in electronic form we can apply what is called machine learning algorithms okay machine learning text techniques on this data and understand that there are regularities which are waiting to be uncovered okay and which can then be used for natural language processing so going back to our transparencies what we said was there are these two views of natural language processing the classical view classical view i have explained now in detail which is completely rule governed and rules are given by human beings these rules contain knowledge and the second approach is the possibility of using statistical or machine learning approach to uncover these rules and regularities underlying the corpus or the electronic text and those rules and regularities can be discovered and used later for natural language processing proceeding further we find that there are these stages of natural language processing and everywhere one could make use of either the classical approach to natural language processing or one could make use of statistical techniques the data driven approach to do natural language processing for example if you take morphology we discussed syntactic analysis some time back if we discuss morphology now morphological rules are given given by language experts but there are lines of work where different word forms are given and from the word forms one 
identifies the suffixes and tries to uncover the rules which govern morphology. Okay. So, it is possible to create a morphology analyzer by making use of word forms, word forms and these word forms can be processed by machine learning techniques for creating a morphology analyzer. So, all the stages that we have discussed morphology, lexical analysis, syntactic analysis, semantic analysis, pragmatics discourse everywhere one can make use of these two approaches. Let us look at the problem of ambiguity. What could be the data driven machine learning based approach to ambiguity resolution? If we see this sentence here, visiting aunts can be a nuisance, this is an ambiguous sentence. Let us understand the ambiguity in this, this was discussed before, I just repeat what the ambiguity is. The word visiting can be an adjective or it could be a gerund, the ing form of a verb which is gerund and this ambiguity can be uh, caught at the part of speech tagging level and this ambiguity may or may not be resolved, but the ambiguity is really the part of speech ambiguity. So, this is the first ambiguous entity. The second ambiguity comes from the role of aunt. Visiting aunts can be a nuisance, the question is who is the agent of visiting? The agent of visiting can be aunts, aunts are the visitors or the agent of visiting can be the speaker himself or herself. The speaker is, uh, is complaining that visiting aunts can be a nuisance, the speaker does not want to visit aunts. In which case, if the speaker is the agent, then the object of visit is aunts. So, aunts are either object of visit or agent of visit. So, we have what is called the semantic role ambiguity, aunt can be the agent of visit or object of visit. So, uh, if that is the case, uh, if aunts are visiting, if aunts are the visitors, then visiting becomes an adjective. What kind of aunts? aunts who are visiting. So, these are visiting aunts and if aunts are being visited, if the speaker is visiting the aunt, then visiting is a jiran, it is a verb and it is denoting the act of visiting. Okay. So, we can trace the ambiguity of this sentence as either visiting being an adjective or a jiran and also the role of aunt being ambiguous. Depending on this ambiguity, the sentence has two meanings, okay? either aunts are being visited or aunts themselves are visiting. So, this ambiguity, the classical view of this ambiguity is that this ambiguity exists and the ambiguity comes from different semantic roles and different part of speech of visiting. Statistical natural language processing would admit that there is ambiguity, but would like to state that this ambiguity is coming from the uncertainty in classif classification. One of the important tasks of machine learning is classification. There are two, two, two different kinds of machine learning. One is classification, the other is clustering. These are two main main tasks of machine learning. In machine learning, when we talk about classification, we say that entities are given class labels. For example, the objects in this classroom can be given different labels depending on what these entities are. For example, I am sitting on a chair, the entity on which I am sitting has been given the label of chair. The object in front of me is a table, so this entity is given the label of table. So, in classification we have entities and we give them labels. How does it apply to the situation in front of us, namely the ambiguity? Looking at the slide once again, 
visiting urns can be a nuisance, we can give a label of adjective on visiting or the other label of jiran on visiting. This will make the word belong to one or the other class. Okay. It can either belong to the adjective class or to the class of gerunds. So, this is a classification problem and this classification is uh, the, the class is unresolved, whether it is adjective or gerund is unresolved. Similarly, the role of aunt is the entity and the classification for this is agent or object. Again, we are talking of two levels agent and object and the role of aunt will belong to one of these two classes agent or object. Now, this is a nice point of view because we are making use of machine learning paradigm. We are making use of the terminology of machine learning and saying that ambiguity is nothing but uncertainty in classification and this ambiguity is resolved by making use of cues from the sentence, by making use of clues from the sentence. Proceeding further, we ask what kind of cues are available to resolve this ambiguity. When we do classification in machine learning, we work on what is called the features of the entities. We classify the entity depending on the features. For example, a, a chair is classified as a chair based on features like it has four legs, there is a backrest, okay, there is an area where the person sits and so on. If this entity does not have the backrest, even if the person can sit on it, it is no longer a chair. Okay. So, there are features, some features are distinguishing for that particular entity, other features may be common with other entities. For example, the backrest is a critical feature for the chair. To be a chair, the entity must have a backrest. So, by looking at this kind of features, we identify the object or the entity and we give it a class label. So, features can produce our decision. So, we understand that the classification happens by making use of the features and the features actually come from the sentence itself and the sentence contains the tokens or the words. So, these words and tokens are used as clues. Let us look at the slide and we try to investigate what cues are used for disambiguation. So, one of the important cues in especially for English sentences is the position of the word with respect to a verb. So, if we take the uh, sentence France beat Brazil in a game, then France is to the left of beat and Brazil is to the right. So, this tells us that France is the agent and Brazil is the object. Okay. This is of course, discounting the possibility that the sentence could be a passive voice sentence and the entity to the left of the verb could be an object. So, Brazil was beaten by France. In this case, Brazil is the object even though it is to the left of the verb beat. However, we are not considering that particular fact. We are considering normal active voice sentence. France is to the left of beat and Brazil is to the right. Therefore, there is no ambiguity of classification. France is the agent, Brazil is the object. So, agent object marking in English is done by means of this very important cue 
namely the position of the noun with respect to the verb left or right. In Indian languages and many other languages of the world, where the word order is relatively free, word order is relatively free, we have to make use of some other clues. So, France beat Brazil in the football game. In this case, France and Brazil have fixed positions in English language, but for an Indian language this need not be the case. Let us look at the Hindi sentence corresponding to this uh, utterance. So, suppose we take this sentence France beat Brazil. The Hindi sentence would be France ne Brazil ko haraya. France ne Brazil ko haraya. But you can also write Brazil ko France ne haraya. Okay. So, the same meaning is conveyed by these two different orders France ne Brazil ko haraya, Brazil ko France ne haraya. Okay. Whereas, for English the order is fixed France beat Brazil. If you change the order Brazil beat France, then the meaning also gets changed. Not so in case of Hindi sentence, not so in case of many Indian language sentences. So, France ne Brazil ko haraya, Brazil ko France ne haraya. These kind of languages where the word order can be changed are called free word order languages, free word order languages. So, Indian languages are quite prominently free word order languages, okay. but if you are discerning, if you are observing carefully, then you can make out that this free word order came because of a particular factor. What was that factor? Notice that France beat Brazil, there were no other language particles in this sentence, only those entities which are actors in this situation. France and Brazil are the actors in this situation, France is the agent, Brazil is the object, beat is the activity, okay. there is a beat activity. In this uh, when you come to Indian languages, the actors are same, but their expression in the sentence are done with the mediation of other language particles. There is this ne which is coming after France, there is this ko which is coming after Brazil. This ne and ko as language particles are crucial for the meaning of the sentence. Ne shows France is the agent ko shows Brazil is the object. Since, ne and ko have this very crucial role to play, they can be moved along with the nouns without changing the meaning of the sentence. Now, since, ne is the agent indicator, okay, the position is now less important. Uh, if you carry ne with France, then you know that France is agent. If you carry ko with Brazil, you know Brazil, Brazil is the object. So, uh, just pay some attention to this point, this is a very crucial point. In the English sentence France beat Brazil, the who is the agent, who is the object? This information is encoded in the position of the nouns. Noun is to the left of beat, Brazil is to the right of beat and that shows who the agent is and who the object is. So, you cannot take liberty with the position of the nouns, otherwise the agent and object roles are disturbed and that disturbs the meaning of the sentence. In case of Indian language sentences, 
in particular Hindi here, the agent and object information are indicated by ne and ko. So, these uh, these make the position information redundant and therefore, we can play with the order of the words. So, I hope this point is clear to you. In English, position encodes semantic role information. In Indian languages, case markers typically encode the semantic role information. Let me write down a very important term for you. We have introduced this term just now. The term is called case marker. Case marker, also called vibhakti in Indian languages. This came from Sanskrit tradition. Vibhakti. So, in uh, Indian languages, case marker or vibhakti carry the semantic role information. Okay, so, that said, so we asked how is the classification solved, class, classification problem solved, because classification problem needs to be solved to resolve the ambiguity. Here we find that for English sentence the clue was the position for Indian language sentence the case marker is the clue France ne. Uh, in Marathi also you can use the same case marker particle ne that indicates the agent role. Brazil ko in Hindi Marathi Brazil la. So, this shows the object role thus the ambiguity is resolved by means of case marker. Uh, it, we can also see that in Indian languages morphology can do disambiguation. France beat Brazil in this case the word beat has ambiguity because beat can be a noun for, for example, heart beat. For heart beat, beat is a noun, France beat Brazil, beat is a verb. This ambiguity does not exist for Indian language because for Indian language the Hindi sentence will be France ne Brazil ko haraya, haraya this is a verb and this is a verb is simply shown by the fact that it takes the suffix aya. This aya is a past tense marker, it is an indicator of past tense that gets attached to the root verb her, her is to defeat or to beat and the Marathi example is shown here haraula, haraula. So, these suffixes show that this word is a verb. Okay. It does not have to face the ambiguity that English beat has, beat can be noun or verb. In Hindi, there is no such ambiguity. So, let us uh, recount all possible clues which have been described. For English, position is the cue or the clue for this ambiguation. For Indian languages, for nouns, these are the case markers and for verbs, it is the morphological suffix. These are the clues. Proceeding ahead, we consider these clues or cues as very critical for our classification task or the disambiguation task. Cues are like attribute value pairs and we can make use of this attribute value pairs for uh, installing for, for launching machine learning algorithm on the natural language data. Let us uh, recount here the various constituents of machine learning task. Any machine learning task first has to specify what the goal of the task is. Does it belong to classification or is it a clustering kind of task? Then we have to uh, clearly demarcate the features and the attributes. 
for example, in natural language the features would be word position, the morphology, word label that means, the word category, noun, verb etcetera. The actual values of these features for example, for word position it could be the left or the right position with respect to the verb. The value of the morphological feature could be a particular suffix for example, aya for past tense in Hindi, word label or word category the value for that could be noun, verb etcetera. Then having looked at these three features, we take the next most important constituent which is the training data, the corpus or the electronic text which is annotated or unannotated. We will explain annotation or unannotation in a minute. This forms an important constituent. Then there is this test data, the test corpus which is important for evaluating the machine learning algorithm. The accuracy of the, uh, of the learning situation that means, the classification. The accuracy is measured by means of precision recall, f value, map score etcetera which again we will explain and also many times we perform what is called the test of significance. We go from a small sample space to a general uh, class and that requires test of significance. Let me now describe a very important concept the concept of annotation. Annotation uh, sorry we concentrate on this word annotation. Let me describe annotation for a few minutes. Annotation is very critical for statistical natural language processing. Statistical natural language processing thrives on annotation. So, we uh, illustrate annotation. Annotation means labeling, okay, producing labels. Let me give an example of this. Suppose, we have the sentence people laugh heartily, people laugh heartily. They may be laughing at a joke or a particular situation, people laugh heartily. So, there are three words our corpora now is three words long, our corpora is three words long. On this if we produce annotation, annotation can be of many different kinds. So, let us first do the simplest possible annotation. Simplest annotation. part of speech label. Okay. Annotation we said is a labeling task, we are doing part of speech level. So, people laugh heartily. We produce the following annotation, we say that this is a noun underscore noun this is a verb underscore verb and this is an adverb let us say we produce the word ca character a. So, n is noun, v is verb, a is adverb. So, what we have done is that we have annotated our corpora people laugh heartily with the labels n, v, a respectively. So, this is the simplest kind of annotation, the part of speech annotation. Let us do a little more complicated annotation. What could be a more complex annotation? 
more complex annotation. We say that people now we will produce the annotation below the words because we are creating more complex annotation. People laugh heartily. So, in this case people is a noun we can say takes s for plural this is an annotation okay. animate this is a semantic annotation okay. semantic annotation. So, people is a noun it takes s for plural it is animate it is also a collective noun. Okay. So, we have produced these four pieces of information for the word people, noun, takes as for plural, animate, collective noun. So, one could imagine many different kinds of annotation, many different kinds of annotation and can enrich words with this kind of labels to make it a very informative text. Let us go to laugh laugh is a verb all of us know that. What more annotation can you produce this? Laugh takes e d for past tense this is an annotation laughed. It is a verb of state okay. it is a verb of state that means when people are laughing they are at a particular state as opposed to let us say verb of motion. If you say people run speedily, okay, instead of people laugh heartily, people run speedily. In this case, the verb is run and the word run is a verb of motion. The word run is a verb of motion, but when we say people laugh heartily, people laugh heartily. So, when they are laughing they are in a particular state. So, it is a state verb. Okay. It is a verb indicating a particular state. For heartily when you go to the word heartily this is an adverb I produce the letter a for this. This is a, an adverb of state of state. Okay. So, this is an adverb of state we record all this annotation okay. So, we have produced two annotation marks for heartily three for laugh four for people. Now, adverbs we know can be of many different kinds adverb can be special adverbs of space, adverb of time, adverb of manner and so on. So, this particular adverb people laugh heartily it will be more correct to say this is an adverb of manner. Instead of adverb of state we call it adverb of manner. So, this is the task of annotation and I hope you are clear about what happens in annotation. Let me summarize this particular point once again it is a very important point. We start with uh, words of a language, the words of a text or sentence. So, these words are placed one after the other to produce a meaningful sentence. Sentences are produced one after the other to produce a meaningful paragraph. Paragraphs are produced one after the other to produce a meaningful chapter. Chapters form a book and so on. Okay. So, gradually from words we go on building bigger and bigger textual units and ultimately produce a very large textual entity. So, when these words are taken up for processing what we have in front of us is a raw piece of text. This piece of text is meaningful, meaningful to a human being a, an expert in the field somebody who has world knowledge, somebody who has knowledge of the language can see that these symbols have a meaning. Not so for a machine. A machine may not be equipped with so much of world knowledge, 
so much of expertise of language, a machine needs annotation. Okay. So, when we have uh, taken the three words people laugh heartily, we had to produce labels on them saying that people is a noun, people is a collective noun, people is animate, people takes s in the form of a plural and all these and many other pieces of information can be put down on the text to enrich it and this kind of enrichment of the text with labels is called annotation. So, I hope the notion of annotation is very clear to you. This is very, very critical for natural language processing. We have to understand annotation very carefully. Let me make another point which is related to this and a point of great interest. Who produces annotation? When annotation is done, it is done by human beings, people who understand the language and people who understand the meaning of the words. So, as a human being, I produced N on people, I produced V on laugh, I produced A on heartily with the understanding that these words have noun role, verb role and adverb role respectively. How did I know that people is animate? That is the world knowledge part. Okay. As a human being who is a part of society, we know people are animate entities. Okay. And not only that, there are more complex issues. We know that this is a meaningful sentence. This laugh and heartily form a meaningful verb adverb pair. Okay. So, there are it is possible to have some meaningless pairings. Uh, this very famous sentence from Chomsky, which has been made immortal in natural language processing. Uh, this sentence colorless green ideas sleep furiously, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. This is a sentence which is very, very famous in the NLP literature, uh, has lot of historic value. Now, this sentence is strange in many different ways, but one of those uh, strange things about this sentence is this, uh, this uh, very unusual verb adverb combination sleep and furiously. Sleep is a peaceful activity, it is a peaceful activity and furiously is a is an intense, vigorous state. Okay. And these two words are therefore, uh, mutually incompatible. So, if you put sleep and furiously together, it is a strange combination and people would raise their eyebrows looking at this particular sentence. Okay. So, people laugh heartily was not a strange sentence. We made use of our word knowledge and also knowledge of the language, knowledge of the properties of the words and we could understand the meaning of the sentence and annotate it with proper labels. Okay. So, much for annotation. Proceeding further, let us just remember what we said for machine learning. The constituents are goal, classification or clustering features or attributes are the clues for classification, values of the features they decide what the decision would be, training data where the corpus is marked with different levels for training, test data the test, uh, test corpus or the test text which are used for evaluating the algorithm and there are ac accuracy of the classification in the form of precision recall if value map score and test of significance. We will have occasion to explain precision and recall which I will do after some time. Now, let us understand the output of a machine learning NLP system. We have said that the statistical approach to natural language processing makes use of statistical technique. 
it makes use of classification algorithms to produce levels. And now, let us understand when we apply machine learning algorithm on textual data, what is the output we get from this machine learning system. The first option is we could get a set of rules. Okay. So, the rule can be in this form if the word to the left of the verb is a noun and has animacy features that means, the noun is animate then it is the likely agent of the action denoted by the verb. So, since uh, people the word people was to the left of the verb laugh and people is also animate then it is very likely the agent of the action denoted by the verb namely laugh. So, taking more examples the child broke the toy here child is the agent because child is to the left of break and it is also animate. In the sentence the window broke the window is not the agent because even though it is to the left of break it is inanimate. Okay. So, both the conditions have to be satisfied the word has to be to the left of the verb and it must have the animacy feature. There is another way the output of the machine learning NLP system can be produced. This is option number 2 and the output can be a set of probability values. Okay. What we saw earlier was a was a rule an actual rule whereas, in this case the output is a set of probability values. So, it is expressed in this form the word is to the left of the word and has animacy. So, in this case the probability of the word being an agent is much more than the probability of the word being an object, which again is more than the probability of the word being an instrument. So, everywhere you can see we are expressing the probability by means of a conditional expression. Probability agent given that word is to the left of the word and has animacy. The word uh, being an agent is the event we are considering. So, probability of being an agent is more than the probability of being an object is more than the probability of being an instrument. So, this is the way the probability value can be produced. This is to be contrasted with the output that we saw last time this was the rules. Now, we will finish this lecture with a uh, very quick remark on the difference between classical NLP and the statistical NLP. In classical NLP, we obtain the rules and these rules are embedded in the computer. The rules come from the linguist who is a human being. In statistical NLP, these rules or the probabilities they come from the textual data namely the corpus and the machine works with those rules. So, in both cases there are rules and it could also be probability values, but in classical NLP they come from human beings and in statistical NLP they come from textual data by means of machine learning algorithm. We will make more insightful remarks on these things uh, in the next lecture.